Number 10, the war to end all wars. All right, hear me out. Everyone knows about World War I, but that doesn't mean it wasn't weird. World War I was probably one of the weirdest wars to ever be fought, technologically speaking. To put this into perspective, the first successful flight of airplanes was by the Wright brothers, it had only been done five years prior. World War I is also noted for the first use of tanks, chemical weapons, just to name a few party favors. But perhaps the weirdest thing about World War I was the use of old war tactics against new war tech. It was quickly discovered that running directly into machine gun fire is bad for your health. Number 9. Just say no! Honestly, just a classic move. Great Britain being broke needed a new revenue stream. In total Pablo Escobar style, the British forced their way into China where they fought a war, and China was forced to cede over Hong Kong and other ports along with letting Britain come in there and just sell all this delicious opium. It's weird because this is a similar tactic to what you'd see with cartels and gangsters. Not a country. If old Ronald Reagan knew what was really happening during the opium wars, he'd be rolling around in his grave. Just say no, kids. Number eight, the pig wars. This is so weird, it could only be real. So here's the rundown. After America had beaten Britain in the Revolutionary War, it was time for Manifest Destiny, expanding westward. The British were doing the same thing. They got to the Pacific West Coast, and everything was cool, except for some islands not too far from the mainland. It was heavily debated on who owned these islands. Surely this can be resolved without conflict. Yes, it can be, and don't call me Shirley. Well, it almost turned into another global war, actually. Both Americans and British were living on the island, and when a British-owned pig had gone one step too far and eaten out of an American field, that pig paid the price with his life, causing tensions to escalate to the point where the Navy and high-ranking officers got involved, partially being stoked by an American who, to this day, no one knows the method to his madness, but was honestly just looking for a fight regardless. What a crazy guy. Shot a pig, we're gonna start a war. Number seven, the Anglo-Zanzibar War. Never heard of this one, I bet. And as a comedian, I can appreciate the comedic value of this war. Not that wars are funny, but trust me, you'll see. The Anglo-Zanzibar War was a military conflict fought between the United Kingdom and the Zanzibar Sultanate on the 27th of August, 1896. Good year. What's very unusual about this war is its length. No, not because it's still happening today in a technicality like the Korean War, but rather how quick it ended. The conflict lasted about 40-45 minutes. The British Navy began a cannonade at 9am and had destroyed a large amount of the Zanzibar force by 945, leaving only one British sailor injured. The leader of Zanzibar made his escape, and the British officially moved in. Brutally moved in as well, actually. It was an occupation, it wasn't good. Number six, for the Emperor. This one is my personal favorite on the list, as it's a story too crazy to believe, but it is very true. Strap in for this one, folks. What do you call it when the war you were fighting ended 25 years ago, but the enemy still thinks it's on? Yep, that's right. If you don't know, this actually happened, and while not a new war per se, it is technically their own little war. What I'm referring to is the Japanese holdouts of the Second World War. In the Pacific Theater of War, Americans adopted a strategy called island hopping, which basically saw Marines clear out dug in Japanese forces all throughout the many islands of the Pacific. When one was cleared out, they would move on to the next, and so forth, and so forth. Except, the thick jungles of these islands are good at hiding things. More specifically, hiding Japanese soldiers who continued to fight World War II, even though it was over years prior. Every few years or so, more soldiers would come out of hiding and surrender. But the most extreme case being Hiro Onoda, who was fighting the war for almost 30 years from 1944 to 1974. During his time hiding, he raided and unalived local Filipino farmers. Next time you go to the jungle, just be careful. You don't know who's out there. Always watching, Mike Wazowski. I'm always watching. Number five, Mad Jack Churchill. Again, not exactly its own war, but uh, Buddy here was fighting his own war, basically. Meet Mad Jack Churchill, a British commando who went into battle with a sword and bagpipes. I'm gonna say that again for the people in the back. Went into a modern war with modern weapons using a sword and bagpipes. When asked about his medieval ways, Jack replied with, Any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. To add to this already insanity that is Mad Jack Churchill, he holds the record, or title, for the last recorded longbow kill in history. 
That's insane. When in 1940, a poor German soldier met the business end of Jack's barbed arrows. His military career was very impressive, having become a commando and escaping capture from Germans later in the war. He would then marry his wife and stay with her happily ever after for 55 years. That Why is there not a movie of that guy yet? There should be a movie of that guy. Number four, the football war. Everyone loves football, and next time the World Cup is coming home. Okay, bad impressions aside, this war is over football, but sort of. It does have a little to do with land and agricultural disputes between Honduras and El Salvador. The dictator of Honduras at the time began to use El Salvadorians as a scapegoat, which made tensions sour between the two Central American countries. As it turns out, it was time for the 1970 World Cup and they were facing each other, but after some classic sabotage by both teams, tensions got even worse, as Honduras began to crack down on immigrant farmers from El Salvador. They'd had enough cut all diplomatic ties and declared war. Sometimes referred to as the 100 second war since it was so short, but sadly thousands of people died and it didn't really solve anything. But we still got football though, right? Come on, everyone loves football. Number three, the Falklands War. If you look at the globe and take a look at the very southern tip of South America, then slightly east of that, you won't see very much. And that's because there isn't very much there. However, what is there is a very small island called the Falklands. It was colonized by Britain, France, and Spain in the 1700s, but because it was so far away, it wasn't really a top priority for any of the imperial powers. Everyone kind of had more important stuff going on. Well, fast forward a few hundred years and now Argentina wanted a piece of the action. Thinking taking the islands was going to be a cakewalk, Argentine forces took over. Britain, feeling like Argentina didn't respect the holy playground rule of dibs since they left a plaque on the island stating that it was theirs, went to war. A war which sadly did cost a few hundred lives. Today it's remembered for its losses and the leadership of Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher. Number two, the enemy of mine enemy is mine friend. This is just too weird not to mention, May of 1945 was just a bad time to be a German evil mustache man. Actually, he was kaput, but the war still raged on. The weirdest battle of the month would have to be the Battle of Castle Itter. High value French prisoners were being held in a castle that had been transformed into a prison. A small American force approached the castle when the Germans were spotted. The Germans immediately surrendered, and then offered to aid the Americans in liberating the French prisoners. Yep, that's right. Trouble is, there was a German SS force that wasn't going to let that happen. So it was Americans and Germans versus some naughtier Germans. And after an intense firefight, the joint force would be victorious and the prisoners freed. Number one, second rate ostrich. Any remaining Jedi will be hunted down and defeated. Any collaborators will suffer the same fate. I don't, that was terrible. Anyway, sorry, that's my Palpatine side coming through. Sorry about that, guys. This is gonna be the weirdest thing you're gonna hear all week. Okay, I'm willing to bet most of you folks at home have never heard of the Emu War, which may be because the Aussies don't want you to know about it, as it is a little embarrassing. But basically, this is how it went down. The Great Depression sucked for everyone. Australia was hit rather hard as they relied on agriculture culture exports. People just weren't buying. To make matters worse, there was an abundance of pests destroying crops. The worst of these crop eaters are knockoff ostriches, emus. So many emus were running amok that the farmers asked the military for help. The military, not wanting to mess around, obliged by sending a couple of men with two Lewis machine guns. When the pack of bloodthirsty emus was shot at, they ran away, and only a small number were killed. This happened multiple times, so much so that it was jokingly said that the emus should receive medals for their valor. Of an estimated 20,000 emus wrecking havoc, only about 1,000 were terminated. The army also spent a lot of machine gun rounds for this operation. So in a nutshell, the emus kind of won. Yikes. Number 10, Crying Wolf. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was a conflict between Vietnam and US forces in 1964. What's messed up about that is that two days later, it happened again. Actually, it didn't. Big prank. The second incident was fabricated by the US just to justify ramping up their presence in Vietnam. Sadly, it worked, as the next eight years in Vietnam would end up being a total snipe storm for the US, as they would encounter problems abroad and at home. Thank goodness this is the only time the American government would ever lie about anything ever again, right? This was officially declassified decades later. Number nine, Agent Orange. The world agreed not to use chemical warfare after the First World War, as it was extremely cruel and lethal. 
So you might be surprised that America used chemical weapons during the Vietnam War. Agent Orange, brought to you by the Dow Chemical Company, was a herbicide and defoliant dropped and sprayed from air vehicles to cut down the thick jungle brush. Viet Cong soldiers were excellent at living off the land and concealing themselves in the jungle. Bad guy hides in jungle, you remove the jungle. Makes sense. The chemical was extremely effective, but what's so messed up was the negative health side effects. Soldiers that were exposed to the chemical developed cancers years after the war. But what's even more crazy is how it affected the Vietnamese people. It created children with really bad health defects, and to this day, there are many people who live with ill side effects of Agent Orange. That's just not right, man. That's wrong. That is so wrong, dude. Number eight. French Indochina. The US was not the first superpower trying to tame Vietnam. Vietnam used to be called French Indochina, and it used to be a colony of France. And when they no longer wanted to be a part of that, France came down to give them a piece of their minds. But you can probably guess how that went considering the US was there 20 years later trying to do the same thing. While France was trying to keep a colony, and the US was trying to stop communism from spreading to other countries, Vietnam was trying to fight for its independence. Which is ironic for America because that's how they became a country. And yes, I know that the communist movement in Vietnam wasn't great by any standards, but the regime America was trying to put in place was no better. As much as France would have liked to keep Vietnam, Times were changing, and there was no victory in sight, with or without American support. Number 7. Well, that escalated quickly. Up until 1967, the war was bad. But it was nothing compared to what was going to happen in 1968. In 1968, the Viet Cong launched the Tet Offensive, a massive military campaign designed to destroy the foreign invaders. All across the country, key targets were being attacked, and it seemed overnight that the war went from a 6 all the way to an 11. What's so messed up though is even though the VC did not achieve major victories, it was costing a lot of American lives. With the Viet Cong using the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the war not only escalated in Vietnam, but had reached neighboring nations like Cambodia. This had an effect on the war back home. The US thought and told people it would be a quick war. They had the advantage. But after the VC flexing their military might, it was clear that more US soldiers would be needed to win the war. Which some people were beginning to question in the first place. And as time went on, most people would protest America's involvement. Number 6. A Terrible Loss of Life The Vietnam War is one of the most important events in US history, and honestly world history too. It was a very hot war during the Cold War, which we could do a whole video on that itself. A time of superpowers ready to annihilate one another at the push of a red button. Thousands of young men volunteered or were drafted to fight in a war that would humble the very powerful country. 58,141 Americans would lose their lives in order to contain communism. Of that 61%, they were under the age of 21. That is an insane, I can't even believe that. The Vietnamese lost over 300,000 people in the conflict. The war is remembered for being a tragic loss of life, and the domino theory that communism would spread throughout the world if containment was not initiated didn't happen, as most countries today just aren't communist. Number five. Civil Rights If you know the 1960s, then you know it was a decade of change. A lot of history to unfold in just 10 years. Again, we could probably do a whole video on that. The Vietnam War is especially important towards the Civil Rights Movement, as black Americans were a big part of the war effort in Vietnam. Black soldiers were nothing new to the American military, but their integration with white soldiers was. Every war previous, soldiers of different skin color were separated into different units. While most soldiers got along, there was still a long way to go, as black soldiers were still often mistreated. It seemed, however, that in a war zone, white Americans and black Americans were fine, but at home, had tensions. We could do a whole video on civil rights and segregation, but to sum it up, racial relations made Americans ask questions. And for black Americans, the question is, how is someone expected to fight a war in a foreign country that we really have no business being in for a country that won't allow a certain group of citizens to even buy a cup of coffee because they're not allowed to enter the building due to the color of their skin? Just doesn't make sense, man. Number 4. Mattel 16 The 1960s saw a lot of technological development. The extensive use of the helicopter comes to mind. During the early years of the Vietnam War, Americans were issued a brand new rifle. The M16 was a brand new design that flopped as hard as it could. 
as it tended not to work. Which, if you're in a war, is kind of not what you want to happen. Your stuff's kind of gotta work. A rumor had spread around that the firearm never needed to be cleaned, which in a jungle setting with mud and rain just doesn't make any sense. This, with already existing flaws, made it jam and was rendered useless by soldiers. Nicknamed the Mattel 16 after the toy company, some soldiers were forced to use enemy weapons, which sadly in some cases may have led to fatal incidents of friendly fire. Number three. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Another very useful tool in destroying the Vietnamese jungle, trees are made of wood, and wood burns, so set them ablaze. Except napalm is different. A chemical compound meant to burn at a very hot temperature of 5000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it would burn for a while. This was used in multiple ways, but probably the most effective with airstrikes. While not the first time firebombing had been used, as it was proven effective in the firebombing of Japan during World War II, the Vietnam War saw almost the same amount of ordnance dropped, napalm and others included, as used in all of World War II by America. That is an insane statistic. It had a terrible effect on people, as it can burn skin off. The most infamous picture from the Vietnam War had something to do with this. We can't show it to you, but you've probably honestly seen it already. The military would later disband its use, as the ability to control napalm's destructive power is limited. Number 2. GI Kebab while the Viet Cong may not have won many battles against the US, they were still formidable fighters. They had the lay of the land and laid traps everywhere. From 1965 to 1970, 11% of American casualties were related to Viet Cong placed traps. What's so messed up in that is that in a modern war with modern technology, a lot of the traps the Viet Cong were using were something out of the Stone Age, but still deadly. Improvised explosives, swinging spike balls, trip wires, single shot cartridges, and snake pits right out of Indiana Jones. I can't even believe that's real. But the most effective were punji pits or punji sticks. A large hole is dug and bamboo spikes are placed at the bottom. Then, out of pure evil, urine or human excrement is put on the spikes. A thin layer of leaves or cover is placed on the trap, so when someone comes along, they would fall in a pit of spikes. That if that didn't kill them, an infection from the waste would, or make recovery very, very miserable. That is just, that is cruel, man. That is, that ain't right, man. That ain't right, Chief. Number one, Apocalypse Now. Tiger Force was a long range reconnaissance unit that later became known for its acts of war crimes. Not sure if there could be war crimes when everyone's doing naughty things, but. Okay. To quote Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now, charging someone with murder around here is like handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. And like a scene right out of that movie, the members of Tiger Force had a tradition to make necklaces out of ears. I'm going to say that again. They made necklaces out of ears. There are a number of things Tiger Force committed that are honestly just not safe for life. But that's war at the end of the day. War as hell. Number 10. Live long enough to become the villain. Saigon isn't Saigon anymore, and while many great efforts were made to thwart the Viet Cong, the finger quote good guys lost. There's a little bit of irony in the story, however. Think about it for a second. America was a colony who fought a very hard battle for their independence against the most powerful foreign power at the time. Fast forward to the Vietnam War, and here they are trying to fight a war for independence against the most powerful foreign nation. Different in details, but Mm, the same in broader terms. Sadly, it was a tragic loss of life on both sides. And while you always want to pick out the hero in every story, in war, it's not exactly black and white. More of a gray area. Number 9. No More Heroes Looking at photos of soldiers coming home from war, you'll see people hugging, cheering, laughing, kissing, and raising a glass to toast the return of their sons and daughters. There's a famous picture from VJ Day that you've probably seen as a sailor kissing in the streets. However, sadly for Vietnam vets, the return home was not with welcome arms, cheering crowds, or celebrating of any kind, really. The veterans were met with pretty much the opposite. Vietnam was the first war to ever really get the media coverage that it did. For the first time, Americans at home got to see what was going on. And it wasn't pretty. Over time, disapproval for the war grew to the point where it was protested and soldiers did not receive the care that they needed. As much as we'd like to meme nowadays with Vietnam flashbacks, these soldiers' mental health was not dealt with. PTSD, depression, and a country that didn't want them were very real for shell-shocked men returning home. Number 8. 
one of many wars. Despite Walter Cronkite and Bob Hope's coverage of the war, and that's kind of a joke for people over the age of 60, Vietnam was a war in a series of armed conflicts during the Cold War. Yes, for Americans, it was the most memorable to say the least, but there were many hot wars that took place during the Cold War. I'm not really sure how it got that name, but okay. The Vietnam War was a byproduct of the Cold War, just like these other wars and conflicts. For example, the Ethiopian Civil War, the Ogden War, the Dominican Civil War, the Six Days War, just to name a few. Vietnam was the last time US forces would fully send troops on the ground like that for at least a few years. All the previous wars I mentioned were more the style of proxy wars. Basically, the United States and Soviet Union would vicariously fight through much smaller, less powerful nations. Basically, it's like getting your big brother to fight for your little brother. Number seven, rainbow chemicals. Remember the last time when I talked about Agent Orange? Well, there was actually a whole rainbow of colored lethal chemicals used. Orange for trees, Agent Blue to destroy the rice supply, and a few other varieties and colors as well. They became known as the rainbow herbicides. The side effects of these chemicals were horrible creating birth defects in children whose parents have been exposed. Many people still live with these conditions and unfortunately, children born today still have birth defects. Clearly this stuff is awful and should never be used again. I went to the chief's lab last night and he took a look at the chemicals and he said, that's not it. Number six, Ho Chi Minh. The man behind the madness, or at least the communist revolution that he so desperately wanted to take over. Born in 1890 in what was then Indochina, a French colony, his beginnings of being a leader and anti-colonial views started quite young after being expelled from a school for such beliefs. He eventually found his way to France in 1919, where the Treaty of Versailles claimed Vietnamese freedom. His pleas, however, were not heard. A Japanese occupation during World War II and a rise in communism in the East was slowly adding ingredients for a revolution stew. Weird metaphor, but let's run with it. France, wanting to take back their colony, had started the Vietnam War. Now in charge of the communist revolution, it would be a decades long fight with America and South Vietnam before claiming their bloody victory. Could have been prevented, that's crazy too. Like He went to France and he's like, give us freedom. They're like, no, sacre bleu, you go back to where you came from. Number five, helicopter war. Probably the most iconic iconography of the war is the Bell UH-1 Iroquois, or better known as the Huey. The Vietnam War was the first war to see extensive use of helicopters. And honestly, I'm not sure how Americans would have fought the war without them. One of the main reasons the Viet Cong were successful was because they knew the land. They knew the jungle and used many tactics to their advantage. Oftentimes, the jungle being their best weapon of defense itself. Even though chemicals and napalm were being used to help unjungle the jungle, it's the extensive use and effectiveness of the Huey helicopter that gave America the technological edge it so needed. For anyone that was actually there, I can just imagine the relief of soldiers that they must have felt when seeing those green beauties come barreling out of the sky. The helicopters turned out to be a great design and was used for many years after the Vietnam War. Number four, draft dodging. Grade 12, what a great time to be alive. You're about to graduate. All your friends are excited about spending one last summer together before everyone goes off to college. Maybe you'll spend some time down at the beach, go hang out at the mall, or maybe you'll find a summer fling at a summer party. Nice. And just as you were about to put those bell-bottom jeans on, your mom says you got a letter. Oh no. You just got drafted into the Vietnam War, and it looks like you'll be spending your summer looking for a guy named Charlie in the jungle. That's weird, I wonder where he is. This was a reality for many young Americans who found themselves looking at a piece of paper that either meant they could die in a jungle or be in trouble with the law. However, when option A and B suck, go for C. In this case, that was draft dodging. Americans who received the mandatory volunteer letter fled in decently large numbers to other countries so Uncle Sam couldn't have his way. Many ended up here in Canada. Number three, Napalm Girl. I briefly touched on this in the last part, but Kim Fan Tee deserves a moment of her own. There's a picture that made it out of the Vietnam War known as Napalm Girl. Well, Kim is that girl. Again, we cannot show you the image due to its graphic nature, but it's basically screaming Vietnamese children running down the road after a napalm strike near their location. Unfortunately for Kim, she was an innocent victim of total war. Her clothes were burned off and her skin was severely damaged by napalm, leaving her with scars and reminders of a horrible past. Almost 50 years later, she's still around to tell the story and how she used faith and forgiveness to forgive those that caused so much pain and destruction to her country and herself. 
The photograph of Kim is probably the most infamous image of the war, and maybe the 20th century, and is a part of the media coverage that helped inspire Americans to pull out of the war. Number 2. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Good old Tricky Dick had just become president, and he had a plan to end the war in Vietnam. But first, they had to invade Cambodia. Why Cambodia? Well, basically, the Viet Cong had this genius idea of moving war goods, materials, and troops on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but also moving through Cambodia, which at the time was neutral. The US just wasn't looking there at first. However, when it was realized it would be a tactical good decision to stop that from happening, for poor Tricky Dick, the invasion of Cambodia felt like he was furthering the war rather than trying to bring it to a close. To make matters worse, the Pentagon papers were leaked, and it was discovered that America had increased involvement and not decreased. The people had had enough, and anti-war movements sparked across the country. It wasn't too long after this that they pulled out of Vietnam and Cambodia. Number 1. The Music A lot can be said about the Vietnam War, but if sitting through history classes and watching some old movies doesn't paint the picture, then sit down and have a listen to the music that was made during the conflict. A lot to do with counterculture at the time, once the Vietnam War went into second gear, art began to have its take on the Far East conflict. Books, movies, plays, but nothing more reachable and mainstream as music. The Doors, Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, and the classic CCR. If your thoughts of Vietnam don't feature Fortunate Son by CCR, is it really a thought about Vietnam? I say no. This is kind of disturbing as when you compare it to music one decade prior, it's completely different. Despite baby boomers causing havoc on minimum wage retail workers today, their music is pretty good and does a good job of depicting the emotions felt in such a grim situation. Yes, I love the music. I, I love the music of the American people. <laughs> Number 10. Not Till the Fat Lady Sings most people would be delighted to know that a war is over. War sucks, it's expensive, costs lives, and uh, come on man, it just sucks. Officially, North and South Korea have not signed a peace treaty. That's right. Although they both agreed to an armistice in 1953, on solid paper, there's no surrender, which technically means they're still at war. This sounds bad, but it can't be, right? Not as if tensions between these two could ever be high. It's not as if they're scheming of ways to undermine each other and just waiting for an excuse to open the biggest can of whoop ass at a minute's notice, right? Everything's fine. I don't know if everything's fine. Number 9. Up and Down The Korean War was a great military success and everyone went home happy. Very nice. Great success. Uh, just kidding, actually. It didn't really solve anything. What's so messed up is everyone just kind of ended up where they started. North Korea had pushed into the south, almost making it all the way south, when the very effective UN organized a police force of multiple nations, mostly US, and punched their way back up to the 38th parallel. But maybe we better go further, ballsy General MacArthur Douglas said to himself, admiring his own reflection in the mirror, pushing their way all the way up to the Chinese border, where 250,000 Chinese soldiers helped the UN force by pushing them back down to the 38th parallel, putting everyone in the same position they were in the beginning. It's almost as if war was the pointless cost of life. Nah, that can't be, right? No. Number 8. Nuclear Threequel This one is kind of scary, honestly. So, during the Korean War's impression of snakes and ladders, game of borders, and front lines changing like the wind, General MacArthur was getting frustrated with the progress, or lack thereof. He wanted a quick solution. Something that would bring a swift end to the conflict, all while flexing a little muscle in the process. Being a big fan of how the US annihilated two cities in Japan in the previous war, he proposed that America once again just start dropping nukes fallout style. While this was being considered, it was ultimately a no cal zone situation, as I like to call it, for the US and the UN. Soviet Russia had just figured out the recipe for nuclear bombs and would not hesitate to send one their way in return. The US had lost its nuclear monopoly and ushered in the age of mutually assured destruction. And thank god they didn't to be honest. I love playing the Fallout games, but that doesn't mean I actually want to be in them. Nah thanks man, I, I'm good. I'm good dude. Number 7. I need a hero. When we all tell stories, we like to tell stories with heroes and villains, beginnings, middles, ends, rising actions, climax, and conclusion. Bad guy hurts good guy, good guy perseveres, and he beats bad guy. Credits roll as the hero walks off into the sunset. Now I'd like to tell you that the Korean War was a tale of good versus evil. 
but it's more like bad versus evil. Korea was split between communist north, supported by China and the Soviet Union, the south was supported by the UN and the US. Each has their own dictator wanting to unify Korea in their own image. Yes, the communists were not very nice, but the right wing dictator installed by the US was arguably just as bad. So in short, a super awesome time to be in Korea. Number 6. Tootsie Slide This one goes out to all the fans of MacGyver, you're gonna love this one. So during a very cold segment of the Korean War known as the Chosen Mountain, nicknamed Frozen Chosen by the very cold marines that were stationed there, temperatures were below negative 25 degrees Celsius and morale was lower. Well, actually their ammo count was. So the marines radioed in an airdrop for Tootsie Rolls, which was just a code name they had given to mortar shells. Apparently, the radio operator receiving this message did not understand this, and the actual chocolate candy Tootsie Roll was airdropped to the Marines instead. Yeah. Not wanting to waste this processed American delicacy, Americans went full MacGyver and discovered that once chewed and placed in bullet holes or in things that needed to be filled, the treat made for a decent enough repair. If women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. Number 5. Stranger Danger We all know if there's a van that rolls up to your neighborhood and there's a man inside offering free candy, it's gonna be a bad time. Well, North Korea might have had the biggest and baddest van in the neighborhood, as it's estimated that 84,000 people were kidnapped during the war. That is so many people. Why was North Korea putting so many faces on the side of milk cartons, you ask? Well, it was mainly a forced repopulation tactic, which again is so messed up, I can't even begin to tell you how wrong that is, but also may have been the beginning of a super secret spy program, where North Korea was interested in having biracial spies, making it easier to infiltrate the enemy. Just one of many nefarious activities North Korea has been up to. There is no spy program in North Korea and I, I am not saying, I, I am absolutely saying this of my own free will. Please do not send help. Number 4. Not actually a war. While there were a lot of bang bang shooty shooty killy killy during the Korean War, technically it wasn't really a war even though it feels like one. Being referred to as a police matter, yeah, the US sent a lot of troops to fight this not war, which in case you're wondering how that's possible, you can take a look at Congress, as Congress never declared war, setting a new precedent. Although after the millions of dollars spent, the loss of thousands of soldiers on each side, plus the UN force being comprised of 16 other nations, I'm not exactly sure how it's not a war, that's like me saying, I did not do my English essay because it's not an English essay. It's a two page opinionated piece that should be four pages, but I didn't read the book and just use cliff notes. Sorry Mrs. M. I mean, come on, can you blame me? Have you ever actually tried to sit down and read Lord of the Flies? Not in a school setting? I called the chief last night, you know what, he said it wasn't it. Number 3. Top Gun Ask any military history guru or anyone who's got a thing for it and they will tell you that after World War II, military tech was about to get a little crazy. On September 8th, 1950, something a little spicy happened in regards to both military and aviation history. The world's first all-jet dogfight took place. Americans in F-80s and communists piloting the infamous MiG. Despite a movie that I actually think isn't very good, this wasn't great for the Americans. Yes, they did end up shooting down the enemy, but it was clear that the MiG was outperforming the F-80. Forced American aviation to come up with something just a little bit better. Come on guys, you can do it. Number 2. Just in case. So it's been years since the Korean War. They've been split in half. DMZ is there. Everything's kosher, right? Well, not exactly. If you follow the news in recent years, you know that North Korea has been doing some unsavory testing with ballistic missiles. However, what some people may not know, and it's kind of messed up when you think about it, is to this day there is still a large number of US soldiers stationed in South Korea, 30,000 to be exact. A remnant from the Korean War, but something that many would consider to be a necessity given the hostile nature of the North Korean regime. Hopefully things stay in a stalemate and don't escalate. We've got enough problems on our hands right now. On a side note, there's also a large concentration of US soldiers in Japan as well. Not directly related to the Korean War, but they are in close proximity just in case uh, anything sneaky happens. Okay. Number 1. Big Boom Little Changes World War I changed lives. It dissolved century old empires, completely redrew the map. World War II doesn't happen without World War I, and it was so bad, the whole world swore to never let that happen again. Heck, even wars from centuries ago had more cause and effect. 
The Korean War is very different in this regard. Like previously mentioned, the communists were bad, but the capitalists were not much better. While the lines may not be as blurred as some wars, the outcome was completely different to what most people were used to. When World War II ended, there was cheering in the streets. When the Korean War ended, there just wasn't much to show for it, besides a tragic loss of life, debt, and a new theory about communism that would literally make the exact same thing happen in Vietnam 15 years later. Seriously, the comparisons are uncanny. It's like the exact same thing. Crazy. Number 10, hold the mustard, please. World War I cannot be talked about without talking about the crazy advancements in technology. Seemingly, nations and empires were just itching to try them out on each other. Airplanes, tanks, blimps, machine guns, mostly fairly new and extremely lethal. However, the life of a World War I soldier cannot be talked about without talking about mustard gas or chemical weapons. In 1907, major world players agreed to ban chemical weapons from warfare. So you can understand the confusion by Allied soldiers on the Second Battle of Ypres when over 150 tons of chlorine gas were released. A terrible weapon that would cause trouble breathing, burns, and vomiting. It was so effective that the Allies immediately began working on their own chemical weapons and gas masks to prevent the effects of this super villain level weapon. I think this quote by World War II General MacArthur sums it up. Whoever said the pen is mightier than the sword obviously never encountered automatic weapons. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Number 9. All quiet on the western front. This is kind of obvious, but people die in war. In World War I, a lot of people died. And a lot of these young men and comrades in arms formed bonds with one another only to have those friends and brothers be killed and taken away from each other. Over two million German soldiers would perish in the First World War, which later would have all kinds of disastrous effects on the country, especially with the rise of evil mustache man. France also lost a similar amount of men. Trench warfare was brutal, and I'll get to that shortly. One of my favorite books and movies, actually, All Quiet on the Western Front, depicts a group of young German boys who are in this thing together all while having a strong anti-war message or at least questioning the legitimacy of the First World War. Just make sure when you're in the trenches, no one's handing you those fresh new boots. It's an omen. Number eight, one star review. It may come as a surprise to some of you, but living in the trenches on the Western Front wasn't a super fun time. We don't recommend it here at Bumblebee. If you're like me, then you love a good hearty meal. Like my mom always said, I'm a meat and potato kind of guy. That's just how it goes. A nice grilled rare steak, roasted garlic potatoes, and a freshly tossed crisp lettuce Caesar salad. Ooh, that sounds amazing. I'm kind of hungry now. And maybe a beer or two to wash it down. Just a classic meal for a classic guy that I really enjoy. Sadly for the boys in the trenches, this could not have been further from reality. Anyone in the military today with our modern technology will tell you how delicious MRE rations are. But for soldiers of the First World War, rations were limited. And as time went on, especially on the German side, where in 1918 rations were whittled down to turnip soup and turnip bread. Ugh. There were still beer rations. However, and if I'm gonna be shot at, I still want a little ale to cure what ails me. You know what I'm saying? Go a long way. Number seven, trench living. I know after a long day of work, most folks like to kick back and relax. A nice warm house, a cold beer, maybe the game's on. You come home to a family that loves you. The life of a soldier in World War I was more of the horrific variety. Basically, you live in a deep hole that stretches for miles and interconnects with tunnels and other trenches. It's freezing cold in the winter, blistering hot in the summer. Rains right on top of you and the mud. Oh, the mud is an issue. Bogged down in a muddy hole, wet freezing with other miserable men who are also wet and freezing. Just not a fun time for anyone involved. I love winter and a good rainstorm here and there, but the difference is I get to come out of the cold after a long day making snow angels or jumping in puddles. The impending doom and being soaking wet would damper anyone's mood. Number six, disease in a time of plague. While living in a trench for long periods of time may suck, there's other things besides spooky spiked helmeted Germans waiting to kill you. Bullets, bombs, and artillery are lethal, but you had a very high chance of dying from disease. A lot of these trenches became isolated from supply lines for multiple reasons, and sometimes could be a logistical nightmare, meaning supplies were oftentimes difficult to come by. But no amount of supply could fix the disgusting living conditions of the trenches. Soldiers claimed by the war would often just rot, as recovering fallen comrades was made difficult in trench warfare, making diseases very easy to catch. Besides influenza and typhoid, the most common sickness would be trench foot, or 
gangrene, where really the only thing to treat it is a trip to the medic's hut with a saw blade to amputate your foot, and which is a pain I cannot even begin to imagine. No thank you. You ever seen 127 hours? It's kind of the same thing. Number five of rats and men. The trenches were a messed up place to be for a human being. Seriously, I, I can't recommend it to anyone. But for a small rodent creature like a rat, it may as well be Caesar's Palace Las Vegas. As a rat, you had access to food scraps, shelter, and everything a growing rat needs. They breed like crazy and have become commonplace amongst the soldiers and decaying bodies sinking in the hellish mud. The rats grew bigger and bolder with some cases of rats stealing food right out of soldiers' hands. Sometimes there was so many that soldiers had to essentially hunt them in order to cull the numbers, as there was no system for removing them entirely. On a brighter note though, some soldiers kept them as pets to keep their minds off the impending doom of World War I and trench combat. So you know what, that's, that's kind of cool, little rat friend. I'll call him Ralph, I don't know why, Ralph's cool name. Number four, No Man's Land. This is what all the chaos is about. The part most soldiers quivering in their boots fear. Maybe it's better to stay with the rats and corpses and freeze. Most soldiers are waiting for one sound. That means two things. A whistle blowing means you're going over the top or the enemy is coming to you. Either way, someone is going to have to cross no man's land, which is the space between two opposing trenches defended on either side with barbed wire, mines, and machine guns, waiting to cut down the enemy charging at full speed. No man's land earns its grim nickname as the bodies that fall out there will stay there and become a part of the battlefield. Rolling artillery barrages were meant to aid soldiers in crossing no man's land, but no amount of help, liquid courage, or any other factor could really prepare you for that first leap of faith, climbing over the top and facing the enemy. Number three, humanity. While a lot of soldiers met their demise to the new inventions of the war, like chemical weapons and improved artillery, trench warfare brought out the worst in humanity. The idea of going over the top was to take the enemy trench. Doing so would move the front line up. A war of inches, if you will. However, you cannot take the enemy trench if the enemy is still there. And that is where the bayonets come in, gentlemen. Horrific as it may be, once you made it into the trenches, the warfare looked more like Stone Age fighting than modern. Swords, knives, rifles in close range, clubs, mallets, and homemade blunt objects, and sometimes fists were used in an intimate setting of a muddy trench just to kill each other. Often being some of the most brutal and intense fighting of the war. Even after all that, Taking the trench was difficult, but defending it was more, as oftentimes armies went back and forth trying to break enemy lines in between trenches. <sighs> no thanks. Number two, sharks with frickin' laser beams. Okay, I know the title's a little misleading, but hear me out. Airplanes and aviation had only been invented a few years prior, or at least a modernized version of them. So humans gained the ability to fly, something people of the past could only dream of. So what's the first thing humans do to this amazing revolutionary invention? Can we weaponize this? Yeah, it's kind of messed up to think about, but when we gained the ability to fly, one of the first real uses we used it for was to destroy each other. Airplanes did play a crucial role in World War I, but not just for ace pilots like the Red Baron, but for reconnaissance. At least the tank was designed for military application. Leave it up to us to strap an automatic weapon and bombs to one of the greatest gifts ever given to mankind. And the sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their frickin' heads are the same energy. I, I think so, at least. Number one, Merry Christmas. This would honestly confuse me if I was a soldier in World War I. It would make me question a lot of things. Things like, why am I here freezing and dying? And shooting at people I don't really have an issue with. The Christmas Truce of 1914 was a truce by the Entente and the Central Powers, more specifically on the Western Front, who climbed out of their trenches to shake hands and share a moment of peace on Christmas. The soldiers, for the most part, got along swimmingly. What's messed up is a few days later, they were back at it again with blowing up and destroying each other. Personally, I don't know how you could do that after sharing a beer with somebody. It just doesn't make any sense. Number 10, third party involvement. You'd be forgiven if you thought the Vietnam War was a really bad war between the United States and Vietnam. Literally every book, movie, or depiction of the late 60s conflict is GIs in green walking through the jungle brush as Huey helicopters buzz over the tree canopies. Chaos surrounding as a Rolling Stones or other influential song from the era plays in the background. The camera pans out to show how thick the jungle is as the soldiers are always looking for someone named Charlie. Wonder if they found him. Forrest Gump jokes aside, good movie, go see it. Yes, that is the Vietnam War for the US, but there were actually a few other countries involved. More than you might think. The Soviet Union and China were 100% supporting 
Vietnamese communists. The French years prior were trying to claim back an old colony, and Australia also sent soldiers to support the effort. And perhaps most strangely, South Korea sent soldiers to aid South Vietnam, so the same thing didn't happen to them. It's just a crazy mix, isn't it? Number 9. Are you done? If you ever find yourself getting captured by spooky, scary communists, maybe you should remember Doug Hegdal, a sailor who was blown overboard by a ship gun and washed ashore to probably the worst shore to wash up on in the 1960s. Maybe that or a nude beach full of hippies, I digress. Doug eventually found himself in a super friendly POW camp. Doug knew he was going to be in some trouble, and if he didn't think fast, was going to be subjected to torment that isn't appropriate for any YouTube or TV show on air. So what did Doug do? A daring escape, you say? Eliminated all his enemies from the stealth that only a cardboard box could provide? Hang upside down with tri-light night vision goggles and wait for guards to walk by? No, my stealth gaming friends, he played dumb. Very dumb, in order to convince the enemy that he wasn't worth very much, so that in theory they would let him go. Not convinced, the Viet Cong tried to get Doug to spew propaganda. Doug made a five head play and pretended he couldn't read. He pretended to be three head. After many efforts, the Viet Cong declared him the incredibly stupid one. He was eventually released back to the US where he gave some intel on the Viet Cong that he remembered over his time locked up, which he remembered to, to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. Doesn't get any more American than that. Old MacDonald had a farm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. Number eight, 360 all scope. Remember the days of Modern Warfare 2? Remember hitting those early spawn shots on high rise with the intervention? Yes, me too. Times have changed, and although the days of waking up early on Saturday morning to rip a little Call of Duty while well, your parents fight in the next room may be gone for me, they are not forgotten. I wasn't the best sniper out there, but I could hit a shot or two. However, no energy drink fueled YY ladder stall compares to the white feather. Meet Carlos Hathcock, a sharpshooter from the Vietnam War whose accuracy would have Robin Hood questioning his bowstrings. He is credited with taking down a lot of enemies from a quite a staggering distance away. However, his biggest claim to fame would be his Robin Hood splitting arrow moment. One day in the Vietnam jungle, he spotted an enemy sniper and terminated the threat. The thing is that Hathcock's bullet went through the enemy scope and ended his sniping career. That's one heck of a shot. Mom, get the camera! Number seven, tall courage. Richard Flaherty was unusual to most US soldiers deployed in Vietnam at the time. He was a short king, measuring in just short of five feet, which was the US requirement for soldiers at the time. His training proved that while he was short, he was just as effective as the other soldiers. Nicknamed the Mighty Mouse and the Giant Killer when in the field, his courage and efforts would see him join the famous 101st Airborne where he was sent on search and destroy missions in the thick jungle brush. His efforts would eventually earn him a silver star and would wind up in the very tough yet mysterious Green Berets. Never judge a book by its cover. Number six, yeah, of course I am the American. Larry Thorne was a soldier and a great leader for US forces training civilians in Vietnam. Distinguished with medals and wasn't afraid to get dirty. He helped defend a base from a Vietnamese attack, and if he wasn't there, it most likely would have gone foobar. However, that's not what's so messed up about Mr. Thorne. Larry was hiding something, something rather interesting. Being a little bit older, it made sense he had been in the military for a while. However, it wasn't the US Army. Larry had fought in two other armies previously. The Finland Army, which was his home against the Soviets in the Winter War, and more disturbingly, fought with the German Waffen SS. Yeah, I am an American and I have no prior actions that would cause you to have any suspicion. Yeah, sadly for the man with all that experience, he perished in a helicopter crash in 1965. His body was recovered years later and was given full military honors when buried. You never know who you're standing beside. Number five, welcome to the suck. Meet Roy Benavidez, a soldier with so much courage and bravery, I don't even have a joke for it. A man who after being severely injured and told he was never going to walk again, walked out of the hospital six months later. He then joined the very tough and elite Green Berets, where he went on a mission and was stuck in hell for six hours. A group of Green Berets, including himself, had been pinned down by enemy fire and it wasn't looking too good. Most of the group, unfortunately, was severely injured or simply just not living anymore. Roy himself had sustained bullet wounds and had been stabbed by an enemy bayonet. He eventually made it out barely alive, and when the doctors got to him, they said he wouldn't make it. So with his last breath of life, 
He spat in the doctor's face to show he was still somehow holding on. When you look at the full story, it's crazy. It's so messed up. I left a lot of the gruesome details out, but definitely check that one out. Number four, hideouts. Officials say the Vietnam War officially ended in 1975. Officially. However, for many, there was much fighting to do. For black Americans, the civil rights movement may have changed things, but there was still a long way to go. Vietnam had a communist utopia to unite and build, and many people simply had to recover from the casualties of war, injuries both physical and mental. However, for one father and son duo, this fighting lasted decades, literally. Ho Van Tan ran into the jungle with his one-year-old son in 1972 after his village was destroyed by American bombs in Operation Rolling Thunder. Fearful that it would be the end of him and his family, he hid from the war. He hid for 40 years and wouldn't come out of hiding until 2013, when he was in his 80s and his son was in his 40s. The men were frail, malnourished, and had severely rotten teeth. Can you imagine what it would be like to live without any technology for 40 years and then to come out of the jungle and find smartphones everywhere? It's just such a polarizing idea. Messed up, man. Messed up. Number three, high times in Vietnam, man. Peter Lemon was one of many soldiers in Vietnam whose efforts defending a US base with a machine gun and his bare hands earned him a medal of honor. Thing is, Peter Lemon wasn't a Yankee. He was a Canuck, born in Toronto. Becoming a Patriot American and joining the war was part of his dream for some reason. What's so messed up about Peter, you ask? It's not about being Canadian in the American Army and really just doing very well. We're cool, I promise. But rather, it's his illusions of him fighting the war that quickly deteriorated. If you were around in the 60s and 70s, you probably took part in a little thing called grass. To say it was everywhere was an understatement, but I mean, hey, these guys were at war. They needed a break. His defense of the US base, while under the influence of the devil's lettuce, is where this point is getting to. Number two, save the trees, man. Like I've mentioned before, the jungles of Vietnam were just as much as an enemy for the US soldiers as the communists were. Agent Orange was used to help unjungle the jungle, but it wasn't instant working and it took a few days to really kick in. Bulldozers were sent in after to help remove the trees. This for the US wasn't fast enough and they needed a better answer. So it was time to militarize some serious logging equipment, a 97 ton tree crusher that made trees 50 feet tall crumble like saplings. However, the machine was prone to breaking down and did get stuck in the mud. And in case you didn't know, towing a 97 ton vehicle out of the mud while being fired upon is not easy. No thank you, I'll pass. Number one, actually Apocalypse Now. Yes, the movie, go watch the movie, the original, not the Redux, you can, you can skip the Redux. Well, based on the book Heart of Darkness, the movie is based around the Vietnam War, but if you ask me, it does a better job of getting the themes across in a more digestible setting. You can take the movie in many different ways, but even at face value as a movie in the Vietnam War, it's insane. It does a great job of showing the horrors of war, the insanity, PTSD, hypocrisy, and the gore that was the Vietnam War. Vietnam War, a war that would leave America slightly embarrassed as this was a time of great change all over the world. Couldn't recommend it enough though, seriously, go watch it. The horror, the horror. Kicking off the list at number 10, A Day in the Life. So as soon as the sun came up, your life as a Civil War soldier began. You would train day in, day out, preparing for battle. It was important that each soldier knew their role to work together as a unit. Now, I would say that there's no time for fun and games, but they always made time to blow some steam off. In between drills, soldiers would do chores just like we do every day. They would cook meals, do laundry, clean gear, and make sure that everything is smooth. Passing the time was done by playing dominoes or poker. Reading was of course a popular way of passing the time as well, but it was a lot harder to get your hands on a book back then, especially when you're running around between marches and battles. So more often than not, soldiers would trade newspapers with their opponents. You would hear about the Christmas peace treaty, but this would happen as well. They would just trade papers. A soldier named Milton Barrett, stationed in the 18th Georgia Volunteers, wrote about this back in 1863. They said, our regiment had just come off picket. We stood close together and could talk to each other. Then when the officers were not present, we exchanged papers and bartered tobacco for coffee. They would do it when the officers weren't looking. That's the most intriguing part. They would manage this by using a small boat. Tricky, always away. The first aerial photograph was back in 1860. James Wallace Black took this photo, not by using drones or any bowling alley crazy technology we have today, but rather just a hot air balloon. This lovely landscape is the town of Boston and you're looking at it from 2,000 feet. This was a long time before selfie sticks. Even longer before that, hot air balloons were being used in warfare. The first account of a hot air balloon being used was 19... 
The first account of a hot air balloon being used in war was 1794, when the French Committee of Public Safety created the Corps d'Astrosiers, which is a hot air balloon squad. They were used in the Battle of Charleroi and Fleurus, and then 70 years later, they were used in the American Civil War. They were pretty large as well, they could fit around five guys, where smaller balloons like the Eagle and Excelsior only carried one soldier. Those were for stealth flights. That'd be pretty brave. Imagine seeing a hot air balloon coming over the horizon and it has soldiers shooting at you. That's incredible. I, I didn't hear about any of this growing up. They could reach up to a thousand feet, so they definitely had a vantage point like no other, and they would communicate with soldiers on the ground using flag signals or, of course, telegraphs. The most successful balloon program in the Union was under the command of Thaddeus Lowe. He and Lincoln were allies, and Lowe actually sent a telegraph to Lincoln once describing the view of Washington from above. Call your friends more and describe your view to them. You might get a few things done. Number eight, bounty jumpers. Fewer than 150 Union soldiers were killed for desertion, and Lincoln was actually constantly writing letters and endorsements reducing soldier sentences from death to labor during the war. That's how bad it got. Deserters were a big problem for both the Confederate and Union armies, so it was punishable by death. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union had 100 deserters roughly a day. That's a lot, every single day. The Union actually used peer pressure at one point just to keep soldiers from leaving. In 1863, the Union offered regiment perks if a certain percentage of original men were on for a following tour of duty. So soldiers inside were making others stay on board. How they did that, what they said, we don't know. Bounty jumpers were men who were paid to fill on the spot of newly drafted soldiers. So these guys would join for a few days and then desert them all over again and join a new post as the new substitute and get paid. And of course, some deserters were branded to avoid this problem. Number seven, daily diet. These soldiers were all around 25 years old. The minimum age to join, of course, was 18, but a lot of these guys who were that young would often lie about their age anyways on paper. So on paper, the average was 25 years. But these guys were kids, basically. They ate mostly crackers. And when I say crackers, I don't mean the salty work snacks that you have today. These were made of like flour and water and just salt called hardtack. They would eat berries, nuts, and fruits, anything they could find is all they had. Most of these soldiers were close to starving to death. Number six, soldiers protest. One third of the Union soldiers were immigrants, and one in 10 were African American. And those soldiers actually refused their salaries for 18 months to protest being paid lower wages than white soldiers. When black soldiers were signing up in the Union Army in 1863, they were only getting $10 a month, while white soldiers were getting around $13 a month. Officers were getting $700 a month too. It was just insane. To make things even worse, black soldiers were then hit with a $3 monthly cleaning fee, bringing that down to $7 a month now. So a protest was in order and it was held for 18 months, and then come September 1864, black soldiers received equal pay that was retroactive to their enlistment date. So they finally were able to send money back to their families after that long. Number five, passing time. You would assume the Civil War and being part of it and everything I've talked about would give you enough anxiety, but gambling was also a common pastime in between battles. And when I say gambling, I don't mean, okay, it's nighttime, let's throw a few bucks down and play dominoes. No, they would gamble on everything. Horse races, chess, euchre, poker, checkers, cards were popular until the end of the Civil War when, of course, they were harder to come by, being so flimsy and all. And when dominoes and cards were out of the picture, soldiers would really go old school and play leapfrog. Yeah, games like that were literally all they had. They would wrestle each other for fun, they would have foot races and bet on them. Bowling would be played using cannonballs to knock down wooden pins. And baseball was also played, but it was a little different back then to how we remember it now. The ball was a lot softer, and there were sometimes only two bases. The only way you were out, also, was if you were hit by the ball. Hence the softness that I mentioned. Number four, coldest winters. With the winter winds rolling in occasionally, soldiers could no longer play baseball outside and peg each other with baseballs. But what you could do was hit each other with snowballs. A little fun, also a little scary. They called it a snow battle. Yeah, a snow battle too. Battle, way more intense. Soldiers would leave with bruises, black eyes, and sometimes even broken bones. Yeah, these guys were blowing off lots of steam and they would plan attacks and take it obviously seriously, as they did with their daily civil duties. Even officers got in on this action. When pieces of ice were no longer available to large units to throw at one's head, other winter games would include skating and sledding. Number three. Food March. In April 1863, a group of mostly women led a march to get the governor's attention. The governor at the time, John Letcher, was joined by President Jefferson Davis. It did not end well. The food situation in the South was not great because food prices changed depending on the status of the war. Outcomes of the battle directly affected prices because they were linked to the CSA's currency. That plus the fact that invading troops from the North would often burn crops when they came through, it was getting worse over time. Come April 1863, this march of women broke windows. They flipped carts 
months until eventually they drew out Governor John Letcher and President Jefferson Davis. John Letcher literally started to throw cash at the protesters. Now they still didn't stop, obviously, that didn't solve problems. It was so bad that the militia almost had to open fire. Number two, the alligator. I mentioned soldiers and hot air balloons, so I must mention the United States Navy's first submarine. How fun. This 47 foot long submarine that was paddle powered, yep, you heard me, paddle powered, so you'd be inside and just, you would do this. We can't call it the USS Alligator because it technically didn't see any active days of combat. In fact, the Alligator, that's what I'll call it, had to be cut loose on its first mission. It was being towed behind the USS Sumter on April 2nd, 1863, right off North Carolina when bad weather hit. The Alligator went down and we haven't found it since. It's still out there. The Alligator is still lurking out there. Only a few months after this new weapon went down, the Confederate States of America launched their own sub, the H.L. Huntley, and it sank the USS Housatonic near the coast of Charleston, officially marking the first time a submarine sank an enemy ship. It also immediately sank afterwards, taking the lives of eight crewmen. So even in victory, you're not safe. They made history, but only enjoyed it for minutes. This is all tragic. Number one. The wage gap. Hundreds of women joined the Civil War and they did so by looking like men. Yeah, they would pull a she's the man and get to work. But the thing is, like I mentioned before, with the CSA's currency being affected by the status of the war, soldiers were getting $13 a month roughly. That's double what a woman could make anywhere on the planet, so they really had no choice but to join. This was long before women's suffrage, so if they thought you were a man, you could use that $13 how you wanted. So it comes to no surprise that women would keep this disguise even after the war ended. In 1909, the US Army officially denied that any woman was ever enlisted in the military service of the United States as a member of any organization of the regular or volunteer army at any time during the period of the Civil War. During the Civil War though, that was the first time in American history when women all came together in a war effort. Thousands of women from the North and South volunteered as nurses. Kicking off the list at number 10, Goose Green Battle. Although the British were taking on large numbers of Argentinian soldiers, their unit, outnumbered, still came out on top. The Battle of Goose Green took place on May 28th and May 29th, 1982. It ended with over 900 Argentine soldiers surrendering. It was a rocky start to the operation, to say the least. Argentinian forces were ready when the British arrived. The main assault force was the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Jones, but BBC Radio straight up spoiled the surprise initially. At the time, they were broadcasting news, as was happening, of the Goose Green attack. The Argentinian forces were tipped off, and then when the attack was finally underway come the morning of May 28th, Jones sadly lost his life, heroically charging at the enemy post. The Argentinian garrison formally surrendered the following morning, and the late Herbert Jones received, as well as his successor of the battalion, Major Chris Keeble, they were both awarded medals. Jones received the Victoria Cross, while Keeble received the Distinguished Service Order. Two para were outnumbered and should have lost when comparing support, but they ended up taking down the entire Argentine garrison, more than twice their own size. Number 9. Bluff Cove. On June 8, 1982, British troop transport ships were attacked from the skies. Argentine Air Forces took the lives of 56 soldiers and wounding 150. British troops were in the middle of unloading when two waves of A-4 Skyhawks from Argentine's 5th Air Brigade attacked. The Skyhawks departed from Rio Gallegos Air Base and originally eight of them were on the way, but three had to turn back due to refueling issues. With warning signals not reaching Bluff Cove, around 2 p.m. local time, the first strike hit two ships, the RFA Tristam and the RFA Sir Galahad. At 4.50 p.m. local time, the second strike hit. This one sank an LSU from HMS Fearless. Number 8. The HMS Plymouth. Just because an explosive is a dud does not mean that it's not going to set everything ablaze. The HMS Plymouth is a Rothsay class frigate named of course after the English city and it served the United Kingdom's Royal Navy from 1959 to 1988. This warship has since been decommissioned and opened to the public but finally scrapped in 2014. The HMS Plymouth was one of the first Royal Navy ships to arrive in the South Atlantic once Argentine forces invaded the Falkland Islands. Plymouth, the Antrim, Brilliant, and Endurance all combined forces to recapture South Georgia on April 28th. This was Operation Paraket. On June 8th, during the Bluff Cove air attack, Plymouth was hit from the skies, but the four explosions did not go off. They were all duds. One of them ended up hitting the flight deck, detonating a depth charge, and a fire broke out but none of them really went off, you know what I'm saying? Five men were injured on the Plymouth, but later on in the wardroom of the ship was where the surrender of the Argentine forces was signed by Lieutenant Commander Alfredo Astiz. So there's a lot of history in that one ship. Number seven, Battle of Mount Harriet. 
Taking place in the late hours of June 11, 1982, the Battle of Mount Harriet is one of the three main battles that took place during the Falklands War. And they happened all on the same night. I keep saying the dates also just to really drive that information into your head, but these operations went down roughly at the same exact time. The British had 42 Commando Royal Marines, artillery support from a battery of 29 Commando Regiment, and Royal Artillery. British war correspondent John Witherow recalls the naval support at the Battle of Mount Harriet as blistering. Here's a quote from Witherow on the evening of June 11th, 1982. We were involved with one night attack on Mount Harriet when the Welsh's guards were coming up as backup. This involved marching for several hours on a very dark night through a minefield. Sporadic shell fire slowed our progress tremendously and eventually we made a base out of Mount Harriet, which was coming under incredible fire from a frigate offshore. The whole mountain seemed to erupt in flame. It seemed impossible that anybody could survive an attack like that. And this went on for well over an hour, just shell after shell whistling over our heads and hitting the mountain. Eventually this was lifted and Marines went in. And to our amazement, there seemed to be an incredible amount of fighting going on. There was a lot of tracer fire. The whole night was being lit up by flares, which cast a dead, unrealistic pall over the whole scene." End quote. 26 soldiers were wounded, and both Corporal Lawrence G. Watts and Acting Corporal Jeremy Smith lost their lives in the Battle of Mount Harriet. Number six, Mount Longdon. One of the most violent firefights of the Falklands War was the Battle of Mount Longdon. The night of June 11th, 1982, many recall as one of the most horrifying. 23 members of the Parachute Regiment lost their lives, while 47 others were injured. Veteran James O'Connell was 22 years old at the time. He recalls being at death's door. I had dressings covering my face to stop the blood, and I remember being loaded onto a stretcher. I heard one of the guys carry me saying, this one's alive, and the other say, is he? Well, let's take him back then. There was a makeshift mortuary, and I think I was being taken there to be placed with the dead." End quote. He was literally on his way. I can't imagine what that feels like in numerous ways. O'Connell was hit in the head and face. A bullet went through his nose and right eye. It just went through his cheekbone entirely. And on top of that, they couldn't even get helicopters to Mount Longdon for 12 hours. So O'Connell, as well as many others injured, had to just wait it out. The British forces consisted of 3rd Battalion, artillery support from 29 Commando Regiment, Royal Artillery, Parachute Regiment 3 Para under Lieutenant Colonel Hugh Pike. Number five. Battle of Two Sisters. The third battle that took place on the night of June 11th was the Battle of Two Sisters. This battle, as well as Mount Harriet and Mount Longdon, were brigade-sized operations that all happened, remind you, on the same night. The British were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Whitehead, and the support consisted of Royal Marines of 45 Commando, the anti-tank troop from 40 Commando, with support from 29 Commando Regiment, and naval support from the HMM Glamoran. Originally, 45 Commando was to seize Two Sisters Mountain overnight, hiding in the darkness, and if there was enough time, use said darkness to advance onto Tumble Down Mountain. Argentine forces were ready, so the second phase of the attack was unable to happen as they wanted to. In total, 22 British soldiers lost their lives, a destroyer was hit, as well as three helicopters. 22 were killed, with 47 wounded. Number four, friendly fire. On the 6th of June, 1982, an incident occurred which claimed the lives of four British soldiers. Navy destroyer HMS Cardiff destroyed the friendly Gazelle helicopter. So what happened? How does something like this happen in the first place? Well, the HMS Cardiff was on lookout for Argentinian forces. Supplies coming into the Falklands Islands, is, of course, is a no-go. So on the night of June 5th, HMS Cardiff was stationed east of the islands, and at 2 a.m. they detected the British Gazelle helicopter, thinking that it was an attack. The helicopter was actually making a routine delivery with both equipment and soldiers on board. So what went wrong here? Well, first, after the Sea Dart missile was fired, the next morning it was assumed enemy fire was initially responsible. The Ministry of Defense stated they didn't want to cause further anguish to relatives while they were trying to piece together what went wrong. So it was a lot happening in one night. So some articles made it sound like they tried to hide it. It was really just they had their hands full and it was an accident. A lack of communication between the Army and the Navy was to blame, but not one individual per se, confirms the Board of Inquiry. The 5th Infantry Brigade had not notified anybody of the helicopter's flight, so it was a surprise to many, especially coming in at that speed to that location. The radar also doesn't look good at 2 a.m. when you see that blip coming in. And on top of that, the helicopter's identification friend or foe transmitter, the IFF, it was turned off at this point because it had previously interfered with the Army's anti-aircraft system. So it was just an accident. Number three, HMS Sheffield. The Type 42 guided missile destroyer was the second Royal Navy ship to be named after the city of Sheffield, Yorkshire. In response to the Argentine invasion, Sheffield was sent to retake the islands on April 2nd, 1982. Captain Salt had ordered the ship to change course every 90 seconds to avoid submarine threat. 
The two weeks prior to the attack, Argentine forces were training against their own ships, which happened to include Type 42 destroyers, the same class as the HMS Sheffield. So they knew the radar detection distances and the reaction times like the back of their hand at this point. They used a technique called pecking the lobes, which meant that they would avoid detection by flying on the side of the emitting radar, out of sight. The destroyer was hit on May 4th and foundered while under tow six days later on May 10th. Number two, the Battle of Seal Cove. Just west of Lively Island during the Falklands War, the Battle of Seal Cove was also underway. On May 22, the British frigates HMS Brilliant and HMS Yarmouth were supporting Operation Sutton. This was happening right off of San Carlos Bay when they received orders to stop and take over an Argentinian coastal supply boat, the ARA Monsoonan. It was a 326 ton British coaster that had previously been owned by the Falkland Islands Company, but during the invasions, the ship was captured. It was also loaded with 150 drums of fuel and 250 sacks of flour. The HMS Yarmouth opened fire and forced that vessel to beach on Seal Cove. And finally coming in at number one, young soldiers. It's important to remember how young these brave soldiers were at the time. I wanted to finish this list off by sharing the words of a Royal Navy veteran who was only a teenager during the Falklands War. Craig Mac McDermott was 17 at the time. Craig was on the HMS Antrim in 1982 when conflict took off. The actual location of the Falkland Islands is different than most expect. Craig explains his initial thoughts at the time. He shared this in the Daily Record last November. When I first heard of the Falkland Islands, like many people, I thought they were just off the north of Scotland. I didn't know where they were, but there is no way I will ever forget them after everything I've witnessed. We were naive and too young to understand the severity of what we were about to encounter. The air attacks were constant and there were several injured during each of the attacks. The suffering was indescribable and something that I'll never be able to forget. Thank you for your service, Craig.